Hello, everyone. It's actually Esther, not Heather. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Did you guys have a great time together? Anybody want to just shout out something you learned? Something you, that, that's a really great takeaway. Just actually raise your hand and I'll pick on you. Anybody? Yes. Mercy. Mercy. Anything else? Yes. I am enough. Something else. Put Jesus in the center. Put Jesus in the center. Awareness. Awareness. Self-awareness. Okay, great. Well, we're going to jump right in. This afternoon, I am just keeping it very simple. I want you to come away with two main points. Um, and this first one. Wow. Living life in the plural. Part of emotional health is perspective. How we perceive things, how we frame things, can cause to either view challenges or changes positively or negatively, right? So a friend of mine has this quote, Dr. Alicia Britsholi says, we whisper you are never alone to frighten children. We offer God is with you to grieving souls. We affirm your Savior is near to the lonely and then proceed to live alone in our heads. Isn't that true? Let me say it again. We whisper you are never alone to frighten children. We offer God is with you to grieving souls. We affirm your Savior is near to the lonely and then proceed to live alone in our heads. Let me just start our time together with prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that we can have fun together. I thank you, Lord God, that these ladies are connecting with each other and with you. Father, I pray that you would just speak to us in this last session together, that we would come away just being inspired to walk more closely with you and to each other, with each other. Amen. Amen. Well, I tell you, this has been a monumental time for me in my life, the last like six years. Um, I started on a mentoring retreat back in two, well, no, now it's been eight years. Goodness, time flies. Uh, 2015. And I didn't realize how much I was living this out and how much I lived alone in my head. It takes a mind shift to live abundantly because left on our own, we go into to thought patterns that aren't always healthy. And I've always thought about this, living abundantly, living the victorious life. What does that really mean? What, is that? what, what does that look like? Now, I've had many, many wonderful times in the faith. I grew up in, in the church my parents had a wonderful story. My dad was radically saved when he was 19 in Brazil, and he was radically saved. There were revivals flowing through Brazil at the time. He came over to um, America when he was 21, met my mom. They got married, and they really determined to just serve the Lord with everything they had. Um, but anyway... As life unfolded for me in my Christian walk, I, like we talked about this morning, just believing the lies of the enemy, there is a certain perspective about living that if we take it on, it is possible to live abundantly. It's in the ordinary of life that we prepare mentally for tough times. So I have a, a oh, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do another giveaway. Hmm, let's do that right off the bat, because I don't want to forget. We're going to be touching on this book a little bit. It's called Find Your People by Jenny Allen. Hmm, let me see. <laughs> Who shall I? Hmm. Oh, well, let's go here. Who's, who's been the longest at this church? Ooh, how many have been here 10 years? Oh, stand up. How many have... Okay. Oh, whoa, great. How many have been here 12 years? 14 years. 15 years. 
16 years. 17 years, 18, 19, 20. Together? Okay, so you came together. That's not fair, I don't have two books. <laughs> All right, come on up here. Find your people. I did that intentionally because the longer you are in a church, the longer you are in a group of friends, the more it's easy to not see those that are coming in alone. And so it's just, just a reminder to all of us, and this is what we say in our church too, that no one should be, sit alone. No one should be alone in church. But it's so easy for us to not see the other person. So we're going to get to more of the community second half. Anyway, um, I'm going to read from a book that... I'm going to quote from her. This is all, I'm not going to give this one away. Sorry, I'm, I have it all written in. But this is another great book to have, Liturgy of the Ordinary. Tish Harrison Warren is actually an Anglican priest. She's a female Anglican priest who is now probably in her maybe early 40s. But when she wrote the book, she's got little kids in tow. And she's just trying to figure out how to apply the Christian faith on a daily basis so that it's real. So it's a really great read. But she mentions that in the ordinary of life, if you think about God being the Word through His Son, the Word, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? You, a lot of you know that scripture. The Word came and dwelt among us. Well, if you think about it, the Word of God came to earth. He went fishing. He slept. He woke up in the morning with morning breath. He probably didn't brush his teeth. I don't think they had toothbrushes at that time. But he did all the daily things that we do. He grew in wisdom and stature. The Bible says he grew. But we forget sometimes that he, like, went through everything we went through, right? So Christ's ordinary years are part of our redemption story. So Warren, in her book, writes, the crucible of our formation is in the anonymous monotony of our daily routines. It's interesting, you know, I've, we've had people from our church um, that have gone into missionary contexts globally. And, you know, you look at them and you applaud them and, oh, my goodness, they're doing so many things for, for the kingdom. And then you call them a few months into it and they're like, oh, the dailiness of life is here too, right? Even on a tougher level because you're adjusting to culture. But it's in the daily living that we have the, we, we create the disciplines that will keep us going and staying near to the heart of God. It's so important, and this is what I want to get across to you. It's not like a three-point sermon. It's that it's so important to centralize Christ in our everyday. So what does that mean? I used to think it was prioritizing God, right? We, we hear that a lot, right? Prioritize the Lord in your life. Well, I'm going to take a shift. Okay, if you think of prioritizing him, it makes me think of my shopping list. Okay, so... One of my favorite meals of all time is simply just freshly, freshly chick made chicken in olive oil or grapeseed oil, whatever you prefer, and then putting it fresh on my salad, right? So in the morning, I decide I want to go to the store because I don't have any chicken. So my grocery list is going to have chicken at the top. Like, I am going to come home with chicken because I want this fresh. It has to be fresh. And so I go to the store, get sidetracked, buy everything else, leave the store, and I don't have my chicken. You know what? Even if I'm halfway home, I'm going to go back and get that chicken because it's my priority of the day, right? So we think of God that way. But now think of centralizing God. So that looks very different on my shopping list. Centralizing God. Now, my husband and I are getting older, so now we don't just eat to have fun. We eat to live. 
<laughs> so the idea of health is ever present in our minds. So what's central to my list is, are ingredients in the foods that are healthy and that nourish us. So it now becomes central to look at all the ingredients in everything I buy and see if it's healthy. So it weaves its way in and out of my decisions of what I buy and what I don't buy. So being central is different than prioritizing. So you mark it off your list. I mark off my time with the Lord. I mark off my time going to church. But centralizing is a very different concept. Along with that, when I, when I did this mentorship program in 2015, one of the big takeaways for me was that Alicia, Alicia Bricioli, she's, um, she's written many books. If you ever can read anything she does, she's phenomenal. But she does a mentorship program for any kind of business or ministry leader. But she says, what if we lived life in the plural with God? I'm like, oh, yeah, I do, you know. She said, well, then change your terminology. I was like, okay. Why don't you say we for everything? She says, what would it look like if you really added we to your sentences? When you got up and you said, I just can't face the day today. Lord, we just can't face the day today. Suddenly it changes the perspective, right? I am just not good enough for this. Lord, we're just not good enough. Or, <laughs> go along with last night, I can't stand her. <laughs> Lord, you and I, we just can't stand her. Suddenly it changes how you view the situation. The mental shift here takes time and intentionality to develop. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive. Now, I have read that through the years, and I have dismissed it. And let me tell you why, because I thought it was impossible. And then I had to do an exercise. I had to write down every thought that came into my mind for one hour. <laughs> I stopped after 15 minutes <laughs> because I realized by having to write it down, I realized how many thoughts I was not taking captive. Then at another season in my life, and like I said, I'm going to give you some tools. This is a great tool to think about doing. Is It's by Dr. Caroline Leaf, but she has you do a 21-day detox of your brain. And it's intentional. Just eight to 10 minutes a day, you start unpacking the thoughts that you need to take captive. But then you narrow it down to one underlying thought. So what really is that thought that stems to all these other thoughts that is so destructive in your life? I actually had bought the book, laid it down. It was like one of those giant, giant grocery store books on the side aisle. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Switch on your brain. <laughs> Brought it home, put it on the counter, and then forgot about it. Not on the counter. It was like on the, on the little tabletop next to the chair. And um, my husband was going through a tough time in ministry. It was that year that we were just having trouble with a staff person. It was just a lot going on. And he picked up the book, and he began to, he thought, I'm going to do this because I'm just, I, my husband's not a depressive kind of person. He is always up, but this year was a tough, tough year. And he, he said, I'm going to try this. And he started just writing down his thoughts every morning and asking the Holy Spirit to draw light on what was the underlying thought. So you kind of map, mind map it all out. And suddenly, by like eight or nine days in, 
the Holy Spirit just, this is why. This is why. And it was one thought that would catapult all the other thoughts. And I am here to tell you, it revolutionized his thinking about himself. He never realized all that was underneath. So there is something to be said about that verse, and I want to just tell you that we have gotten very messy in our thinking about God. Messy and lazy. There is an intentional part about faith that we need to exercise daily, and that's how we view God in the dailiness of life. John 15, 11 says, these things I have spoken to you that your joy may be made full. Or I should say that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So it is possible to live a joy-filled life and to take every thought captive. So that's my first point is just living in the plural with Jesus is about daily living, thinking him thinking of him in the equation. When you think back in scripture to all those generations, if you read, I'm right now reading through all the kings in the Old Testament, and oh my goodness, like one king will follow, you know, follow God wholeheartedly, then, the, then their son will not. And then, but what does it always say? It says, a generation forgot God. So it's not that they intentionally sinned against him, but because they didn't include him in their everyday lives, eventually they coasted enough that they forgot about him. And I think that that's happening in our society today on mammoth levels. We have generations coming up that don't know the goodness of God. And we have got to live that out daily because it's really... Uh, it's not about just telling people what to do because that shuts people down. It's living it and helping them process it. So I'm going to move on. So that living, living in the plural with Jesus. Number two is living in, in, in the plural of community. This is one that um, we all say it. We know we're created for community, right? Community is important. We all want it. And isolation will always create an unhealthy emotional component. Our district superintendent, Frank Potter, always states that there is one unifying component with all pastoral failures. Now, they, a lot of different things can be in the mix, but there's always one unifying component. And that is that they have isolated themselves. So when you find yourself isolating, you just know that is not of God. I mean, Satan will often just confuse our thinking and think, oh, I just don't need people. I don't need to, you know, I don't forget church. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. Um, no, we're all a bunch of sinners. We are. <laughs> we're on different paths, but we are all sinners. Um, therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. There was a famous um, anthropologist. Her name was Margaret Mead. And she was attributed, now they're saying, kind of saying, well, maybe she didn't say it, whatever. But it's a great thought to think that they found a 17,000-year-old fractured femur bone. And it helped anthropologists realize that that many years ago, there must have been a civilization. Because that fractured human femur bone had actually healed. So they found it. It had been broken, it had healed. Now, if you know anything about that bone, it is, you can't do anything if it's fractured. You are bedridden. And in a, if there wouldn't have been civilization around this person to help her or him, 
she or he would not have been able to survive in that, in that time period. So right there it showed that community was so important to survival. We are safer together. Whether or not this, this story is true, it's the, the story of how we need to live in community. Connection helps share the burden. Always remember that. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens and in that way fulfill the law of Christ. This fall, I had the chance to go to South Africa. I was doing a class and we actually, our class met in South Africa. And so I was able to travel South Africa and go sightseeing, but then also meet the people of South Africa. And I was just, you know, if you study the history of South Africa and apartheid and everything that went on there, that country has been through so, 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 so much. And even now, even though there's still a lot of poverty, there is one thing that they do really well, and that is community. There's a word in South Africa that sums it up. It's actually many of the African countries um, use it as well, but it's really very central to South Africa. It's the word Ubuntu. And ah, you're shaking your head. A powerful word. It really sums up humanity. It, it means I am because we are. Not I am because I am. Not because I am because you are. I am because we are. And so you think of yourself in the context, always in the context of a, of a group. In the book that I just gave out, Find Your People, Jenny Allen, um, she's actually the one who organizes the IF Gathering, if some of you know. If, the IF Gathering is a, great, a, a large Christian women's event. But she shares out of her own need how loneliness is chronic in America. There is such a hole in so many of us. And I'm telling you, I'm in ministry for 34 years, and there are very lonely places. The older you get, it can get lonelier. And so there, is, there has got to be an intentionality here, too, to invest in others. So in her book, she, she states that God is central, should be central in our lives, but then you have to have other layers. So a layer around that would be three to five friends that you just do daily life with. It can be a family member, it can be, but you need to find those people that you just share life with and you're able to say, hey, you know, oh, I'm, I'm in traffic today and I can't stand it. You know, just, just anything. You're just sharing life. And I realized that I didn't invest in that. I invested in my daughters. I invested in my husband. I have my wonderful friend, Linda. I would say she's definitely one of my five. But to do that daily living, I didn't invest through the years. And so it's, I, I encourage you, especially you younger ones, invest in your relationships. You know, keep them strong. But then she says, then you, and, and it's not her that says this, there's a lot of research on this, that the next layer is actually about 50 people that you consider more of your village. And just think of the church, right? This, these are people that you don't necessarily have to do day-to-day -day life with, but you're checking in and they know when you're not around, right? And then there's really only a capacity of about 150 in your network. Now this is all research-based. This is not just Jenny Allen talking. There's a lot of research done right now on loneliness because it's chronic, right? So if you think about it, what society is telling us is the more followers you have on TikTok, the more followers you have on, or, or friends you have on Facebook, 
the more the better. It just means that you're really well connected, right? But really, we don't have the capacity for that kind of connection. And so we're selling ourselves short. Instead of investing in a few, we're in trying to invest in so many. And ministry leaders especially, we, we have to, in a way, have to do that anyway with our churches. But if we don't find those smaller connections, it, there's a deep-seated loneliness that sets in. We live in Northern Virginia. You guys live in Maryland. Maryland's just like Northern Virginia. And you have a lot of people coming and going. And there's just influx and outflux of the church. Um, so find a few. I and mean, that's really what's important is investing in a few. My daughter went to Chick-fil-A in Virginia Beach. Just the, it was just last month. She said, I went to Chick-fil-A and I saw this grandmother. And she was hanging out with her daughter and her grandkids. And they were having so much fun. And I was there with my four kids trying to make it work. And she just said, I looked at her and I just missed you, Mom. And I was like, oh. She said, but you know what? I went up to that old, older lady, and I said, you know what? I really miss my mom, and I just saw you hanging out with your grandkids, and it was like, that's so cool. And she said, oh, it's not my daughter. It's not my grandkids. She said, but her mother doesn't live here, and I don't have any grandkids, so I have become her grandmother. And she said, we hang out all the time, and it fills my need, and it fills her need, and we are just so close. Isn't that cool? Yes. So for those of all of us who feel like, well, I just don't have that, well, let's make some intentional steps, right? Yeah. Iron sharpens iron. Not only do we help each other, but we sharpen each other. So living life in the plural with Christ and living life in the plural with others. I spoke in the first se session about my daughter, Brittany, who had a long trying health journey. So she's continuing to heal. She's come a long, long way in seven years. Well, actually six years. Um, and she's continuing to be transformed just emotionally through all this. But I got to tell you, without her family, without her husband, without her friends, her friends have been, she, even when she was disconnecting, they made sure she didn't disconnect. In fact, one day she called me and said, they just planned a whole weekend for me and I don't want to go. And I said, well, why not? She says, well, I'm just allergic to everything. What if this? What if that? And so I kind of sided with her. I said, well, just tell them you don't want to go. It's okay. She called me back and said, they won't let me say no. <laughs> and they took her, and she had the best time. And it just lifted her spirits, and it just totally rejuvenated her. Those are the kinds of friends we want, right? we got to find those connections. So invest your time wisely in how you centralize Christ and how you connect with others. This church is a gift. You have true blue pastors that love you dearly. But I want you to know that you are a gift to this church, you. When you're not here, when you isolate yourself, you are taking yourself away from Ubuntu, right? You're saying, I don't need it, but you do, and they need you. So as we come to the end today, I really thought it would be appropriate to have communion together as a sign of community. And I just want to say before I go any further, if you're here today and maybe you've been far from Christ or... You don't even know him. Now's the time to just say, Lord, I want to make you Lord of my life. So I'm going to just have everyone bow their head right now. If that's you, I'm going to have everybody say the sinner's prayer with me. But I want you to just 
say this prayer so that when you take communion, you can be completely free of sin because, you know, the Bible says that all we have to do is confess our sins to the Lord and He forgives us, right? Mm. So I want everybody to just say this after me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and you died on the cross for me and you rose from the grave for me and you've given me life and hope I repent of my sin and ask you to be Lord of my life. Amen.